Welcome to the topic on examination of the back and lower limb. This is the commonest examination you're going to be doing. Um, we're going to run through it slowly, give you an overview, and give you a structure to examine your patients or to a structure to take to your patients. So this is where it's all at. This is your overview for your examination of somebody with back and lower limb pain or examination of the back and leg. Walk your patient. Get them to walk backwards and forwards or just have a look at them as they're walking into your consulting room. Um, you might want to get them to do a couple of screeners looking for lower limb power. Um, then in the standing position you're going to look for some red flags. Check your range of movement again. Um, you might want to do a provocation test and I do a Kemp's test to see if I can extend, rotate and load the facet joints trying to reproduce my patient's pain. Trendelenburg and Rongberg are there in brackets, don't necessarily do, but it's there for completeness sake. Then in the sitting position, you might be able to, um, you might need to examine your, whole, your patient completely in the sitting position because they may be in too much pain or, or, or have too much disability to get supine and prone. So there'll be a way of examining your patients completely in the sitting position. Um, and I don't generally use sitting position. If my patients can get onto the examination table, that's where I'll do my examination. But I'll have sitting position for you so you've got an idea of how to go about it. And in the sitting position, check the hips. You might want to do the sitting uh, version of the straight leg raise test, the slump test, assess power, and assess the pace test for piriformis muscle. Don't always do that, but it's something to remember. And then in your supine and prone position, this is, this is where the bulk of your examination is going to happen. Supine examining the musculoskeletal system, um, examining the relevant joints and not forgetting the, the sacroiliac joint. And then in the supine position again, moving on to your neurological examination, um, tone power reflexes coordination, take your time. Um, before you jump into examining the sensation and the various sensory modalities. And then prone, vital, particularly to me, where you can feel up and down the spine, looking for deformities, assessing for joint tenderness, particularly the facet joints, and of course assessing the sacroiliac joints and other muscles that may be of relevance. You can do a femoral stretch test in the, in the prone position, so the third um, uh, provocation test for the lower lumbar plexus, don't always do, but it's a third, a third mechanism or third means of testing. Um, sensation, I don't always check, and Apley's test is there for completeness sake. So let's get on with it. Have a look at your patient walking. Nothing fancy here, I just wanted to reinforce the fact that you need to look at your patient's walking. Look at their gait. Now let's move on to examining a patient standing. You might want to do some screeners. So sit, stand, or squat, stand, assessing for proximal power, then heel walking, assessing L4, 5, and then toe walking, assessing S1. So I've already screened and deemed that the muscle power is pretty good. Then you want to move on to Schuber's test, examination of the range of movement of the lumbar spine. Get a non-marking pen, pick a point um, on both aspects or both uh, posterior superior iliac spines or just a rough line through L4-5. Draw a mark 5 centimeters below that line and then another mark 10 centimeters above that. So you've got a 15 centimeter line. Get the patients to bend forward and touch their toes and see how much that line expands. And it should expand by about five centimeters, so you should have at least a five centimeter range of movement. Classically fixed in ankylosing spondylitis or reduced in ank spond. Then you're going to move on to assess extension and lateral flexion and rotation. So lateral flexion and then rotation. Now Paul's standing here for rotation and um, you can see this, the pelvis moves so it's not fixed so this is not a very good way of assessing lateral, ro lateral rotation. Um, you need to, if you want to assess it, get them sitting. Now but while he's standing we'll just briefly do Kemp's test so we're going to extend, look back over their shoulder on that side to see if we can close those facet joints or um, 
um, put pressure on those facet joints and load them to see if we can reproduce their pain. Again, not fantastic in the standing position. We did it here just for completeness sake. Now, Rombergs and Trendelenburgs tests don't form part of my routine examination, but I've included it in here for completeness. Always remember to be prepared to grab your patients when testing Rombergs. Checking for proximal weakness or proximal muscle weakness when we're assessing Trendelenburg sign. So that's your patient standing. Let's move on to them now in the sitting position. Checking for range of movement. So hips, internal rotation, external rotation. You're trying to diagnose osteoarthritis. You're looking for pain and tenderness. Moving on to the hips, ah, sorry, the, the knees, um, joints of the ankle and forefoot. Comparing sides, always starting with your non-painful side. Telling your patient what you're about to do, sometimes even why. So the slump test, get the patient to slump forward and do a straight leg raise test in the sitting position, attempting to cause, reproduce their pain. Ankle dorsiflexion might worsen their pain, and that's reduced by knee um, flexion. Assessing power, you can do this in a sitting position, so L2 hip flexors, L3 knee extensors. I do them both in turn and then compare sides. I say keep your leg, I normally say keep your leg there, don't let me, don't let me move anything. And then you can assess the, the feet simultaneously. So ankle dorsiflexion, L4, big toe extension, L5, and then plantar flexion, S1. Resisted abduction, external rotation, assessing for piriformis muscle pathology, and you're trying to reproduce their pain. Then you might want to do your sensory modalities with them sitting and it's definitely possible to do. Don't forget about reflexes and coordination. And now we move on to the bulk of our examination, the supine examination. So musculoskeletal leg length discrepancies, so the ASIS to the medial malleolus might be a cause for gait abnormalities and mechanical back pain. I've certainly had a few patients with that. Straight leg raise test, start with a non-painful side, talk to your patient, look at your patient, ankle dorsiflexion, make it worse, and then re reduce by knee flexion. And then you're going to move on to your hip joints. If I do only do the hip joints, sometimes that's enough for my patients, so assessing flexion internal rotation and external rotation, you're checking the range of movement, seeing if you can reproduce any pain. Generally hip pain is anterior groin type pain as opposed to back pain caused by the other pathologies. Now I'm showing you examination of the knee, so starting off with a patella tap, checking for an effusion, then assessing the medial and lateral ligaments. I don't always examine the knee but it may be useful in some now moving on to the cruciate, so anterior and posterior draw sign. And remembering that hip pain can be res uh, hip pain can be caused by knee pain. So comparing sides again, running through the motions again. And then examining the, f the, f the ankle, forefoot and toes. Now you can you should always consider doing Faber's test, so flexion, abduction, external rotation, which I'm about to move on to now, with the heel on the opposite knee. Gently again do this, seeing if you can reproduce pain. So pain in the groin, generally hip pathology, pain in the lower back or upper buttock, generally considered sacroiliac. So if they've got a Faber test that's painful, then you're going to really spend some time examining the sacroiliac joint. Now they may not be able to uh, put their um, 
knees uh, their, their ankles on the opposite knee in which case just place the ankle on the table and then allow them to flexion and flex and abduct so moving on to the neurological examination check for tone don't always need to do assess for power so I get them to hold that leg hold that position don't let me do anything L2 L3 knee extensors do those in turn and then compare the sides and then as I said beforehand you move on to examining the uh, feet simultaneously because you can get your body down to the back of the to the to the foot of the bed so dorsiflexion L4 big toe extension L5 ankle plantar flexion S1 then you're going to go on to your reflexes nothing fancy about that get comfortable checking your reflexes Examiner, examiners and colleagues can see whether you do this routinely or not so knee jerk L3-4 and then the ankle S1-2 and then checking for any upper motor neuron signs don't forget about clonus might be useful in patients such as those with MS muscular, uh, multiple sclerosis and then moving on to the sensory examination using your American Spinal Injury Association dermatomes so light touch comparing sides cotton assessing A beta fibers so L2, L3 and then the L4 dermatomes on the inner side, L5, top of the foot and big toe. And then the lateral aspects of the foot, S1. Get them to close their eyes and tell you if they can feel anything. So close your eyes please and say yes when you can feel anything. Same thing now with your brush. So you're assessing for dynamic tactile allodynia brush allodynia and you're assessing hypo and hyper aesthetic phenomena you might want to do warm uh, sorry before we do that you're going to do pinprick hyperalgesia so you're moving on to um, A delta and C fibers so L2, L3, L4 middle aspect L5 foot, big toe and then S1 laterally. Can you feel anything? Yes or no? Is it up? Is it down? Yeah. You might want to check for cool, so using something metallic or an alcohol swab. And then for completeness we'll assess the dorsal columns proprioception with the patient's eyes closed. Excellent. Let's move on. Prone examination. Get the patient comfortable. Watch them turn over and then work your way down the facet joints. One at a time, all the way down, trying to reproduce the pain. Get a physiotherapist to show you how to examine facet joints and see if you can really mobilize those joints and reproduce your patient's pain. If you look for it, you'll find it. Then assess the sacroiliac joint, the upper and lower poles. Um, practice uh, will allow you to find it easily in patients. And then looking at all your muscles, looking for tender or trigger points that can sometimes play significant roles in patients' back pain, sometimes even upper leg pain. Then it's uh, examination of the glutes piriformis muscles looking for again tendon trigger points you might want to do a femoral stretch test this is the third um, way to do the straight leg raise test if you want to call it I don't commonly do that 
and sensation I don't commonly test as well but essentially that's the S2 dermatome. Apley's grind test um, assessing each knee in turn don't always do don't always do but it might be useful so that concludes this uh, topic